So now I'd like to move on to the MDT and I'd like to introduce uh, Dr Emma Matthews who's a consultant neurologist at St George's Hospital with a specialist interest in neuromuscular disease um, and Dr Stella Vacru who's a clinical fellow in inherited cardiac conditions at Guy's and St Thomas's Hospital. Um, so Dr Matthews I wonder if you might be available to start with your first case and then we'll move on to Stella's case um, and then I'd like to invite Professor Carl White and Dr Pantazas back for the panel discussion to review the cases. Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks, Pass. Let me just uh, share. Hopefully this will work. Can you see the slides? Yeah, Emma, we're just on presenter mode, so you might want to switch. Um, switch to. Oh, so stop sharing and then see if you can share presentation mode and not present a view. Oh, OK, I'm sorry. We'll wait presenting teams. Oh, let me turn my camera off. There we go. Sort of better. Thank you. Yes, yes brilliant. Perfect, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. All right, great. So thank you so much. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's very uh, nice to be able to come in and join this meeting and it sounds like it's been a really fantastic course. Um, so so I'm Emma Matthews. I'm a neurologist. I have a special interest in neuromuscular um, disease, particularly genetic neuromuscular conditions. So at St George's I run clinics for um, the whole range really of neuromuscular conditions, but certainly all the ones that uh, Antonis very eloquently covered um, and also some of the mitochondrial conditions. So the case I'd like to share with you is is a young man who came to me in November 2020. So he had just stopped working as a dentist um, at the age of 42 because of his health difficulties. So he had a background of diabetes type 1, which was diagnosed in 1996, some years before, and he was known to have high cholesterol and a hiatus hernia. So his medication reflected that, although he had discontinued um, treatment for his cholesterol because he had developed some myalgia. But his main symptoms had begun in late 2019, about a year before I saw him, when he complained of his eyes just feeling very achy in a rather unusual way and sore, um, without any significant visual impairment. But he'd also begun to notice he had reduced exercise tolerance with significant fatigue, which was impacting on his work. Um, and then he developed myalgia with a, quite a generalised sense of weakness and then loss of balance. So because the eye symptoms had come first and were progressive um, over the course of the year, he had been seen by Moorfields and they had made the, made the diagnosis of CPEO with retinal dystrophy. And of course, as we heard, this obviously raises, uh, it, it's a mitochondrial condition, it comes under the umbrella of mitochondrial diseases. So this is how he then came to be referred to my clinic. So when I saw him, um, he had obviously the signs consistent with CPEO, but I also thought he was hearing impaired. He really seemed to struggle in the clinic and he did have an ataxic gait, um, but without other cerebellar signs. And I thought um, he had clinically evidence of a, of a sensory neuropathy and was completely areflexic. So his gait may have been multifactorial. There may have been a cerebellar contribution. Um, clinically, I thought he had a neuropathy, but he always declined nerve conduction studies, so I couldn't tell for sure. But obviously by now he had quite significant ptosis as well. So vision was, uh, or impaired vision was beginning to contribute. And he had uh, no focal muscle uh, particular atrophy or weakness, but he had quite generalized weakness, um, although contributed to by significant myalgia. So essentially when I saw him, I thought he's actually, he's a bit more than CPEO. He's CPEO with diabetes. I was convinced of deafness, uh, plus or minus neuropathy and probably um, ataxia. So his uh, problem list became extended. Um, um, his hearing loss was confirmed by uh, audiometry with hyperacusis. Um, I performed an MRI brain scan, which I'll come back to, which was similarly abnormal. And as we've heard, anyone with mitochondrial disease, you should screen for cardiac um, disease, although he didn't report any symptoms at the time. And he had left mental branch block on his ECG. 
um, we were quite lucky actually. So we sent blood for mitochondrial genetics because he declined a muscle biopsy and we were able to identify a large duplication of mitochondrial DNA. Um, and this would disrupt the gene that codes for COX-1, so an important respiratory chain enzyme, and therefore was ultimately considered to be pathogenic and very consistent with his clinical presentation. So as we've heard, mitochondrial disease is essentially a very large umbrella diagnosis. And of course, there are different phenotypes and different conditions within that. And this can be very important in determining cardiac risk and, and what threshold you have for cardiac monitoring. So CPEO itself is a mitochondrial disease. That's fine. It's usually due to DNA deletion disorders. So this patient was already unusual in that he had a large duplication, which is not unheard of. It does occur. Um, and has been associated with CPO, but already he's in a much smaller group of patients that we can, can use, if you like, for experience or to compare um, natural history. So any phenotype where the CPO plus other neurological or systemic involvement is, is called CPO plus. And often within that spectrum, there are then other um, specific diagnoses, one of which is Kieran Sayer. So Kieran Sayer itself has to have the combination of CPO with pigmentary retinopathy and cardiac conduction abnormalities. But other symptoms that are very common um, that he also displayed are cerebellar ataxia, muscle weakness, deafness, diabetes. It's usually, however, pr it usually presents in, in children in pediatrics. So the onset is usually before the age of 20 years, and he was obviously much older than that. So in a way, he was not, uh, you couldn't say he's definitely a Kinsayer because his age of onset is older and he also had a, a duplication, which um, as far as we are aware is actually un unique to him, the specific duplication that he had. So he still sort of remains in this diagnosis of CPEO plus. And you might say anyway, why does it matter? Well, it matters because it helps to, to define um, your cardiac risk. So in Kieran Sayer syndrome, um, there have been some large series reported recently that have reported a heart block um, causing death in up to 20% of patients, including sudden cardiac death. So with my neurology hat on, I, I worried about this man and I worried about his cardiac risk. Um, and then he developed some atypical chest pain and was admitted to Kingston under care of cardiology there. So during the admission, they performed a coronary angiogram, which didn't show any significant uh, vascular disease, an echo, which was normal. And again, his ECG demonstrated left bundle branch block. He then was seen at the Inherited Cardiac Condition Service here at George's, and he actually had several of these investigations multiple times longitudinally, but his halter monitors never showed any um, concerning arrhythmia. Um, he underwent an exercise test and he, he actually did quite well on this. He managed seven minutes. Um, and was asymptomatic and without any particular change on his ECG. And I don't really know anything about cardiac MRIs, but that's a, a snippet of his uh, imaging, which was described as normal. And just to convince you, this was his um, ECG. And of course, he again had multiple ECGs uh, longitudinally and they, they all looked the same. They all consistently showed left bundle branch block without any um, progression. So just to return to his MRI head for a moment, because these are a few slices of his MRI brain and you can see he has multiple um, periventricular small white matter lesions. Now his cholesterol from just a month ago is still 7.7 .7 because he will not take treatment. His diabetes is not terrible but his HbA1c is 60 so, so it's not ideally controlled but it certainly could be worse. So the conclusion from his scan was it's not typical of Kian Sayer because this again was one of our patients, but it is excessive in terms of the white matter changes. Um, and again, we sort of came to, could it be small vessel disease as this vascular disease? If he had had other risk factors or been older, then we might have been more comfortable assigning it to that. But I raise this because I think it's important to remember if you have someone with neuromuscular disease or um, mitochondrial disease, they can still, of course, have other comorbidities or risk factors that also contribute to the cardiac risk. So for him, his cholesterol and his diabetes. And I think this scan probably does represent a combination of some vessel, uh, vascular disease and some reflection primarily from the mitochondrial disease. So he was then discussed at the South Thames ICC MDT because really cardiac investigations themselves had been very reassuring. And he, aside from this atypical chest pain, he didn't have any cardiac symptoms, specifically no presyncope or syncope. 
but we were still I was still a bit worried about how do we risk stratify because he's a bit Kieran Sayer like but he's not typical there's no one else really quite like him because he has this unique genotype and obviously in Kieran Sayer if there is progressive conduction disease because of this risk of heart block there is generally a low threshold for permanent pacemaker insertion um, but this did not really apply to him because he didn't have progressive disease. We had a discussion that others in the group had sometimes um, implanted a reveal device, but even then they had had one patient where the reveal device had not demonstrated anything um, and then there had, the patient had died from a sudden death without warning. So I sort of presented this case because I think it does emphasize several points that mitochondrial diseases are rare. And obviously when we're trying to stratify risk, we do gain a lot from um, being able to cohort patients or share exp experience of patients with the same condition, but we're still learning from any of them. Um, and the, you know, the cardiac risk of mitochondrial disease per se is variable, but phenotype genotype can be a very useful guide to risk stratification. Um, although when you have a case like this, it can, it can equally be difficult. So I think sharing experience is essential. Um, and the other point I think in him was not to forget other comorbidities. And an update really, I've followed him for over two years now and actually he remains systemically very well. He he was offered a loop recorder in the end rather, uh, rather ambivalently um, because actually he was very well, but he declined um, and his ECG remains unchanged with left bundle branch block only. An interesting case. Um, so I wonder whether I will just bring in Stella and present her case and then we can all regroup um, and um, discuss your case in a bit more detail and, and get everyone else's input. Stella, over to you, please. Thank you. Oh, you're still muted. Sorry, I'm trying. Yes, now I'm trying to stop sharing. Um. Sally, you're still on mute, just in case. Um. Uh, can you see my slides now? Yes, now we can see and hear. And shall I share my screen? So uh, is it, let me. Yes, of course, if you could just um, go into Click presentation there. mode. Yeah. This, uh, so Perfect. it's right, okay. Hi, Perfect, thank again. You. Thank you. Uh, thank you as well from my side for inviting me to be part of this click session, which is on mitochondrial diseases and neuromuscular disorders. And I'll go on with our case, which uh, we saw in Guys and St. Hospital, St. Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital, along with St. Peter's uh, Hospital. Uh, it's about uh, a 30 year old woman who was previously reported to be healthy and um, everything started during the emergency C-section she had of your second child uh, when she was found to have persistent bradycardia and she was complaining of fatigue and some sleepiness throughout the day. The ECG was this one, which is abnormal, uh, as you all agree. Uh, it has it's in sinus rhythm. However, the PR interval is a little bit marginal. There is significant LVH and uh, some prolongation of um, the R QR wave, suggesting maybe some pre-excitation. And also there is SST and T wave uh, abnormality in pretty much all leads. So based on that, they asked for a cardiology referral and evaluation. At that time, there were no other abnormalities found on the clinical examination apart from the bradycardia. The patient declined any history of palpitations and she never had any presyncope or any fainting. When we reviewed her family history, uh, she mentioned that she has another sister who is in good health. She had two children at that time, uh, but her mother died in the age of 44 because of liver failure, which was not very well described what was the cause of it. She had also bidirectional Wolfpaxon White and suffered from atrial dehyarrhythmia since she finally had an atrial flutter ablation. She also had a pacemaker implanted when she was 20 years old. From her mother's side, her grandmother also died in a younger age than 60 without knowing many details about that, but she also had a pacemaker. So based on that, she had an echo and uh, as you can see, oops, 
Um, oh, why is this happening? Mm -hmm. And then I need to start this one, but it won't click. As you can see, oh, <laughs> sorry. Anyway, on the, the sort of, on the parasternal long axis, the LV function, the LV size seems to be normal, the same does the RV. Uh, the systolic function is also normal, but some mild hypertrophy of, of the LV walls were noticed, and the septum was measured at about 12 millimeters, the posterior wall at 10, and basically it was suggesting left ventricular um, uh, remodeling, hypertrophic remodeling. The left atrium had borderline volume and the diastolic function was also normal. On the short axis, it was just more prominent that the LV wall thickness was more than uh, the normal that would be expected for this young woman. Uh, she then had a 24-hour blood pressure monitor to evaluate if hypertension was uh, a contributing factor to this hypertrophy. And uh, as you can see, overall, um, the 24-hour the um, the values were a little bit on the high side for the systolic blood pressure, 133 over 78, with an average of 97 millimeters of mercury. When she was awake, it was uh, around 140 over 80, but during night she, had, she was a good deeper and the um, systolic was up to 120 over 70, which is the normal. Or the 24-hour holder that we wanted to evaluate for any bradycardias or any other abnormalities of the rhythm, um, we found that the heart rate ranged between 31 and 79 beats per minute, with an average of 41 beats per minute, which was significantly low. Uh, there were um, several supraventricular arrhythmias noted, 639 premature supraventricular complexes, eight episodes of short um, ventricular of short supraventricular tachycardias with a maximum of 12 beats and no ventricular ectopy. The maximum pause was up to 2.6 seconds during the night, as you can see here. So based on those two examinations, LV8 probably was not likely due to hypertension and uh, there was bradycardia, but we don't know if that was through chronotropic insufficiency. This led to the next investigation, which was an exercise treadmill test. Um, that was the baseline ECG at rest, uh, which was at 44 beats per minute and the pressure, blood pressure was 140 over 90. Uh, she didn't do, do well. She actually managed to exercise up to the third stage of the Brutus protocol and uh, she stopped in the first minute of the third stage, achieving 94 uh, heart rate, which was, some, which was the 50% of the predicted maximum heart rate. In total, she exercised for 6 minutes and 50 seconds, achieving METS 9.5. She stopped the test because she felt shortness of breath and palpitations. However, no arrhythmias were recorded at recovery or during the exercise, and there was appropriate blood pressure response. So this test showed that there was true chronotropic insufficiency. We also did the cardiac MRI to rule out any structural heart disease uh, or any fibrosis and to help in the differential diagnosis. Um, the LV the LV volumes and uh, the RV volumes were normal, and so was the um, ventricular function. But again, concentric LV remodeling was confirmed with maximal wall thickness of 11 millimeters in all pretty much uh, segments. Then mass was normal, and uh, also T1 native values were normal, and there was no LGE. Um, you, you could see this also at the, the videos that are playing in the four chamber view and the sort axis. So the concerning LVH remodeling was uh, something that um, was confirmed and there was no hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or no infiltrative cardiomyopathy. Uh, she also did the electrophysiology study uh, because of the um, abnormal ECG and the pre-excitation features on that, which actually confirmed that there was a septal parahesian accessory pathway with anti-grade conduction and speed more than 300 milliseconds with suprenaline. There was the nodal conduction was sluggish and there was no clear evidence of retrograde conduction via the pathway. Since the patient was asymptomatic, there was no indication to ablate the pathway and especially given the lack of evidence showing robust intrinsic AV node conduction. So she also had Wolf-Parkinson wide and this led to the several diagnoses 
that we had for this uh, woman, which was wolf parkinson white syndrome, concentric alvary modeling, chronotropic insufficiency, and a family history of wolf parkinson white which led and made uh, the suspicion of possibly an inherited cardiomyopathy, and as a result, it was referred to the ICC center. Of course, it was referred for genetic counseling and test, and um, a genetic test was positive, showing heterozygosity for a likely pathogenic missense variant in the PRKA G2 gene with um, a replacement of the serine with proline. It was shown in literature that this variant was um, um, correlated with the uh, disease phenotype, uh, so the patient was finally uh, diagnosed with a PRKA G2 cardiomyopathy, which is a metabolic myocardial storage cardiomyopathy and is an HCM phenocopy. As you all know from this um, slide and figure, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, is um, sarcomeric in 40 to 60 percent of the cases, but still there is another 40 uh, percent which uh, the cause is either unknown, 30, 25 to 30 percent, or it can be phenocopies in 5 to 10 percent. And the most common of those are uh, inborn errors of metabolism, neuromuscular diseases, mitochondrial diseases, malformation syndromes, amyloidosis, a newborn of diabetic mother and drug induced, most of which were covered in the previous talks so wonderfully today. So what is the PRKG2 gene? Uh, what does it encode and why is it important? And this is basically the AMPK protein because that's uh, the um, protein that this gene encodes. Uh, what is AMPK? AMPK is a highly conserved energy sensor kinase, uh, which is which is found across most species and has a very significant um, role in the cellular homeostasis. Uh, it is activated by low ATP levels and uh, as a kinase phosphorylates many metabolic pathways mo um, most of the times, so it enhances catabolic pathways and inhibits anabolic pathways. So it controls metabolism but also my met mitochondrial function and um, um, fission and biogenesis and also plays a role in cytoskeletal signaling and just a, a comment it was uh, thought as uh, it was the baseline the, the, the foundation let's say of the energy depletion as a unifying hypothesis for the pathophysiologic mechanism in, high, in HCM uh, by the Watkins group in Oxford. Uh, the PRKAG2 cardiomyopathy uh, is basically um, the gamma subunit of the AMPK is not well formed. Uh, this leads to glycogen accumulation within the cardiomyocytes and it is these dark purple droplets uh, within the cardiac myocytes as we can see in the bottom pictures with the immunofluorescence, um, immunochemistry. Uh, PRKA G2 cardiomyopathy uh, is inherited uh, in an autosomal dominant pattern and the highlights is symmetrical VH, which can be massive sometimes. There is no uh, obstruction within the vertical. And on the ECG, there are conduction abnormalities, most uh, commonly pre-excitation and bundled branch block. This is one of the largest series of patients that has been published and in a paper back in 2020. And 27 European cardiomyocyte centers, many from the UK, uh, recruited, not recruited, uh, had uh, patients being um, involved, being listed in this study, analyzed. It involved 90 probands with their relatives. And as you can see, um, half of them were male, 64 were affected, 26 were non-affected. Uh, in order to be somebody um, as a patient with a PRKG2 cardiomyopathy, he should be genotype positive and then have LVH, one of the following, LVH more than 13 millimeters, any conduction disorders, VT or supraventricular arrhythmias, ECG abnormalities and skeletal myopathy. Uh, the classic feature was the pre-excitation, uh, but that was found only in one third of the cases. So 67% did not have uh, pre-excitation. With regards to LVH, um, the majority of patients had uh, LVH less than 20 millimeters, and that was also shared in a previous slide by Professor Carl White in his talk. So we don't expect massive LVH in this group of patients. And the majority of the patients recruited in this study were between 13 to 17 millimeters. Uh, the survival of these patients is impaired after the age of 50 and um, there are several problems that they face. The study had a follow-up period of around six years, ranging from 2.3 to 14 years. 
Uh, in the 90 patients, 63, 60, 36% needed a pacemaker, 29% uh, had atrial fibrillation, and then 14 had heart of failure and needed hospitalization for that. 13 died, uh, 8 died suddenly from cardiac cause, and 4 needed heart transplant. This basically implies that prompt diagnosis and treatment and follow-up are very important to prevent maces. So based on this case, uh, which had some very clear features, and we were lucky basically to see because uh, it's a very rare uh, group of patients. What we need to take home, I think, is that clinical history and family history are crucial in raising suspicion for inherited diseases. And uh, this is a proof that diagnosis can be made in the general cardiology, and then the patient can be referred for further, more detailed tests in the ICC center. The second is that a positive test genetic can establish the diagnosis when the phenotype is present. And uh, we always need to think that LVH is not only HCM, but think of other alternative diagnosis, which is highlighted in, through all the click sessions, I believe, and we all now know that. And lastly, uh, that intercenter collaboration is in patients' best interest because it leads to accurate and prompt diagnosis. It uh, helps in better long-term outcome and also helps in family counseling and program. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Sam, for such an interesting case and, and so clearly presented, and I think a lot of learning for, for all of our attendees.